I'd like to open today's completion seminar by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land upon which we meet, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, pay my respects to their um, elders, past and present, and extend a special welcome to uh, any members of indigenous communities who may be here with us today. It's my great pleasure today to introduce Raphael Trunker for his PhD completion seminar. Raph is a talented and driven researcher who wholeheartedly embraces challenging problems and then leads the way in developing the tools and methods required uh, to address them with creativity and with rigor. Melissa and I got an early insight into these traits when he cold contacted us from Frankfurt in 2013, where he was finishing his diploma thesis at the Max Planck Institute for Biophysics and looking for a lab to begin his PhD studies. It was immediately apparent from our brief Skype interview that Raf had an unusually sophisticated way of thinking and speaking about science for someone so early in his training. And with his outstanding academic record, he easily secured an international postgraduate research scholarship from Melbourne Uni to start with us in early 2014. <coughs> Raf has been a constant source of motivation, inspiration, and entertainment within the lab <laughs> and the division. Uh, and he's led the development of some really key enabling methods for our group. His work has already produced a first author paper in the Journal of American Chemical Society, a first author review for current opinion in structural biology, an additional middle author paper in crystal growth and design, and he's barreling towards completion of another important story that I think he'll touch on in his seminar today. A telling testament to the quality of Raph's work and the enthusiasm uh, with which he communicates it comes from the responses we received to a talk he gave at the Gordon Conference on Membrane Proteins in the US earlier this year which was closely followed by a flood of emails from conference organizers, invited speakers, uh, thanking us for his contributions and proposing new collaborative projects based on the work he presented. Raf balances a very busy social schedule <laughs> with an impressive work ethic and active involvement in the student association and volunteer efforts at the Institute. When Raf leaves us next year, for a postdoc at UCSF, he will be sorely missed by colleagues and friends alike. Melissa and I are proud to count ourselves among the many people in this room that fall into both of those categories. Please welcome Raf to the podium. Thanks for this very kind introduction, Matt. And um, yeah, thank you all for coming to my PhD completion seminar. Today I want to talk to you about how we've been investigating the structure and the function um, of transmembrane domains in two very important classes of transmembrane proteins. The March E3 ligases that I'll be talking about to you in the second part of this talk, and I'll start with what single span receptors are. And I want to kick off the seminar by showing you this beautiful video that was recorded using the latest slide sheet microscope at the Janelia Research Campus, showing an antigen-presenting cell in blue that, is, that makes really close contact with this T cell stand here in red. And it is really this immunological synapse in here and all these receptors and ligands in there that tightly control whether this T cell is eventually activated or not. So as I said, we need to only activate this T cell when appropriate. And there are dozens of um, ligands and receptors within this immunological synapse that control this process really tightly. For instance, you can see the T cell receptor over here that binds to peptide-loaded MHC class 1 and 2 molecules. And another protein that will be <clears throat> important for this talk is CD86 that I'll be talking about a bit more closely in uh, the second part of this talk. What I would like, your, would like to have your attention at now is me telling you that most of these receptors and ligands in this immunological synapse are single-span transmembrane proteins, which simply means that they have only one alpha helical transmembrane domain that connects the outside of the cell with the interior. And if you're a lab like ours that is very interested in figuring out how these signals in here are transmitted into here, then you need to know how to work with these single-span transmembrane proteins. And just a little fact on the side, it's not just us who have to worry about these. If you look at all the, all the membrane proteins in the human membrane proteome, you'll find that about half of these only contain one single alpha helical transmembrane domain. So whether you're working on hematopoiesis, immune activation, or cell death, um, you may come across one of these um, membrane proteins every now and then. And um, OK, so what's, what's the deal with these tran single span transmembrane receptors in this case? So if you look at the standard textbook receptor, then they all have some sort of extracellular domain right here. 
a transmembrane domain and some sort of intracellular domain. You may want to think of this as a kinase and receptor tyrosine kinases, for instance. Um, and here, they work somewhat like this, where ligand binds on one side of the membrane, and we have a biochemical change on the other side of the membrane, for instance, a phosphorylation reaction. But what's, what, what I wondered about when I saw these receptors for the first time is, how can they transmit a signal from here to here when they only have one single alpha helix that connects the two bits? It doesn't make much sense. But the answer to this is conceptually quite easy. So what these guys here have to do is, they have to form some sort of a ligamus, and we know that happens in cytokine receptors, receptor tyrosine kinases, because then um, ligand binding in this case can bring two of these receptors close together, and then kinase or other domains in here are in close proximity and then can transduce the signal further down. Um, but what we've become to realize in recent years is that this is not quite true. But what happens is well, we've been finding um, these pre-assembled oligomers on the cell surface already in the absence of ligands and they're inactive. And what ligand binding does in many cases is induce a conformational change that involves specific rotations and rearrangements of these alpha helical transmembrane domains down here that then kick off signaling. And I guess, simply put, the goal of my PhD um, was to develop methods to study these interactions here in great detail and figure out what these transmembrane helices do. And um, so the ultimate goal for this project, for me, or the lab, or the field, would be to um, understand these interactions and great detail to eventually come up with therapeutics and therapeutically target those interactions. And that this actually works, um, I want to show you um, using the thrombopoietin receptor as an example. The thrombopoietin receptor sits on the surface of megakaryocytes and other um, like respective progenitor cells, also in some inactive dimer monomer equilibrium. And then what happens is if TIPO binds, it induces very specific rotations, locks the receptor in into an active state, and signaling via JAK-STAT phosphorylation can occur. Um, so this uh, receptor is interesting for us because, um, for instance, there are patients out there that suffer from a form of myeloid leukemia simply because they have this S505N mutation that locks this receptor into a signaling constitutively, constitutively active state. Um, another reason why this receptor is fairly unique is because there is a drug called l that's currently in the clinic to treat certain disorders that come with low platelet counts. And if patients take this, this drug, the platelet count increases simply because this binds somewhere using a histidine residue in the transmembrane domain and also locks this receptor into a signaling state. And this is the only drug out there at the moment where we really know that this binds to transmembrane domains of single-span receptors. So we think here that if we could get structural information about these states, inactive, active, maybe a drug bound, we could, under, we could better understand how these receptors and related um, other receptors in the type 1 um, cytokine receptor family work. But that said, I mean, we've been, you may say that we've been solving crystal structures and other structures for ages or for decades now. Um, but if you actually look into p in the PDB, um, you will not find a single high-resolution structure for any of those single-span transmembrane receptors. Not a single one that has all the, all the domains, like in a full-length full receptor setting. But what people have been doing instead, and that's what we focus on in the lab as well, is we can study all of these um, domains here in isolation. And we are very much interested in what happens in the membrane, so we can express and purify our transmembrane peptides, put it into some sort of membrane mimetic, and then ask what conformation these alpha helices adopt in the membrane. So there is actually a real difference between a conformation that looks like this or this. And this is what we're interested in doing. And um, so the very first time this has actually worked is now 20 years ago, published in Science by Don Engelman's group. They solved the structure of this glycophorin A transmembrane dimer. And glycophorin A is a, a transmembrane protein that sits on the surface of erythrocytes. Um, p 4 cyprum uses it as one of many invasion receptors, um, for instance. But we know for sure that what this protein does is it, it uses its transmembrane domain to form very strong dimers. And it does so by using this, we call it now the glycophorin A motif, which is a GXXG motif, which simply means that four residues apart, 
these two glycine residues sit on one side of the helix, and it forms a very strong and stable dimer because these can literally wrap around each other and come into really close contact. So and this is the first time we actually saw one of those in a high resolution structure. Um, ever since then, the last 20 years, not too much has happened actually. So if we, this is what we believe is a full list of all the high resolution structures of, um, unique, of unique receptor systems out there, where we have these high resolution structures like for glycophorin. And I highlighted the one that Matt did um, during his postdoc and um, PhD. And I have to believe him when he tells me that you know, solving a structure like this takes about three to four years and um, takes up lots of resources, very um, specialized instrumentation. So we thought maybe we should go ahead and try if we can get a, a crystal structure for some of this system. And because um, like crystal structures, if it works, it could potentially be very quick and cheap to do so, but also it has the advantage of NMR spectroscopy that it's easier to observe higher order ligaments that may form in the membrane that the NMR spectroscopy so far just hasn't seen. And um, to start this project, really, we thought we'll start with um, using glycophorin A as a pseudo sort of um, um, proof of concept protein to try and get a crystal structure of that. Because um, first of all, we needed to know whether if we take a very hydrophobic transmembrane domain out of a membrane, can we grow a crystal out of that? We had no idea whether that would be possible, and many people would think it wouldn't be, because it, like, it would be very hard to grow a crystal with a hydrophobic transmembrane domain. And then second of all, if it happens and we get the crystal, um, can we observe native like dimers or ligamas, how they would actually occur in a membrane. Because there's billions of these helices stacked into a very crowded crystal, and we're not sure whether it would actually observe something like this. So we thought we'll try that, and I'm not gonna show you how we purify those peptides, even though I spent probably 80% of my PhD doing so. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> probably 80. Yeah, so we, we, we'll make these peptides ourselves in E. coli, and then we put it into something called lipidic cubic phase to go into crystallization trials. And for this, we basically just take a specific sort of lipid, we mix it with the membrane protein and the water buffer system to establish this basically just three-dimensional lipid bilayer. It has all these channels in the middle, but a membrane protein that would be happily reconstituted in here should be able to diffuse around this lipid bilayer system from like here everywhere, and if we find the right conditions in the crystallization screen, um, where we screen for buffers, um, ions, and other polymers to try and find the right conditions, then we can grow a crystal out of that. And then you'll see here in this example, um, these are really stacked in membrane layers that will make up the crystal. Um, but you know, we, when we purify our peptide and before we spend hundreds or thousands of dollars in going into crystallization trials, what we really need to know first is whether these peptides or proteins that we make are happy and stable in this lipid bilayer. Because imagine they're not, and they all precipitate here, then they will never go ahead and form a growing, nice, diffracting crystal. So as a pre-screen, I talked to, um, to Mark and Kelly at Imaging and thought we should try something um, called LCP, fluorescence recovery after photobleaching. And the idea here is fairly simple. What we do is we label these membrane proteins or peptides, in this um, case glycophorin A, with a fluorescent dye. We put it into the system, and then I just dispense like a little blob on this uh, microscopy slide, seal it, and then you can see here already this is basically the, the fluorescent signal of my labeled peptide in the lipidic cubic phase. And what happens now if I um, so if I want to know whether my protein is happy and can diffuse in this bilayer system. Then we can bleach a little area, as we've done here, and then you can see that this bleached area recovers again, simply because these other glycophorin molecules in the vicinity that were not bleached can diffuse back in here. So we have basically a direct measure of um, peptide diffusion in this lipid bilayer system. Um, just to show you another protein that didn't diffuse so well, or that wasn't so happy, this is when I put in the first construct that I purified for the thrombopoietin receptor. You can see here it's all pretty much precipitated, lots of speckles, and this area here will never really recover, not within days. And then 
after we measure these, these fluorescence recovery curves, we can, oh, this recovery, can, we can plot curves to quantify all of that. And we can see here that glycophorin is very stable. The diffusible fraction will approach almost 100%, meaning that all of my glycophorin can move. But TPO will somehow plateau around the 60 70%. And this is all in really low concentration. So we're using this assay to screen a lot of peptides that we're interested in crystallizing. Um, but I want to show you now what happened when we put glycophorin into crystallization trials. And we were actually quite surprised because within two hours after setup, we got these beautiful hexagonal crystals of glycophorin. And some people have said, you know, glycophorin can never be crystallized. And um, a few days later, we got the second crystal form that crystallized over here. And I want to show you what uh, we saw when we solved that structure. Um, we basically can see that in the asymmetric unit, which is basically the smallest unit that will repeat itself in the crystal, um, we can see two of these glycophorin A dimers that are stacked into this space here. You can find a um, monoline a lipid, LCP lipid molecule tightly bound here as well that breaks the symmetry a bit. But basically what we're seeing is the glycophorin A dimer that I've showed you earlier that Don Engelman saw 20 years ago um, published in Science. In, um, in the crystal structure. And you can see here again, this is this glycophorin A motif, where those two helices come really closely together. And what's really interesting now is, so if you look at, for instance, in what, if we zoom out a bit in the crystal and look at what this crystal looks like, first of all, you can appreciate that there's really billions of um, helices stacked really tightly together. And, you know, if you, so what we want to know is, when we crystallize these, will we observe native interfaces? I mean, I've shown you that we observed this here, but pretty much, and if you remember, uh, if you think about how this protein sits in the erythrocyte membrane in a parallel topology, so technically, um, we have to go in this crystal, we have to find every um, parallel dimer that is in there, because a parallel dimer could always be a dimer that also occurs in the membrane. And we can see here, Pretty much when we do that, we'll find that the entire crystal, the only arrangement of two parallel helices as they can occur in the membrane are these two and these two or these two, and they're basically the, the glycophorin A transmembrane dimer. So there was no interface that would, have, that would have led us the wrong path if we had no idea what the structure of glycophorin A dimer looks like. Um, so we were pretty encouraged by this and pretty happy to see that. And to conclude this section, um, we showed that we are able to crystallize these very hydrophobic transmembrane domains and that there's the potential for us to actually see native interfaces in the crystal. And, um, <clears throat> and so these are here the NMR structures and now in the lab in the last couple of years we um, self-destruct the crystal structure of the glycophorin A transmembrane dimer that I talk, told you about. And then Costas, a former postdoc, worked on DAP12, which is a, like a signaling adapter protein in NK cells, and he solved the trimeric and tetrameric structure here. So we basically showed that we can do this, and we're very encouraged by this. And um, as Matt already mentioned, um, I went to Boston a few months ago to present the glycophorin A structure, and then after this, there was this guy, Cyril Fleischmann, and he came over and said, oh, that's really exciting, because we have designed all these transmembrane helices, and we have um, a structure prediction for what their structure would look like. Um, but we couldn't find any LMR spectroscopists to want to spend the next 10, 15 years solving eight of, of our structures. And um, he basically asked us if we can do anything. And um, we just recently started that. And just to show you, because we were very happy about that, <laughs> um, we tried crystallizing eight of his peptides last month, and four of them already crystallized. And we're currently working on figuring out the structures of these. But what this taught us is that if we want to go into crystallization trials with these helices, we want to make sure that we use um, very stable helices that like to form specific dimers or specific oligomers. And maybe we have to come up with ways of enforcing specific dimers when we think about other biological systems. And um, from here on, I want to switch gears a little bit and leave the crystallography behind. Um, at least largely, and tell you about another process that we've been interested in studying in the lab for a while now, where crystallography actually didn't give us a good answer. And um, so we had, because we couldn't crystallize these proteins, and I'll show you why, probably, and um, we needed to come up with other ways of study and function here. 
And um, as I showed you in the beginning of this talk, um, this process will have something to do with antigen presentation and regulation of MHC class 1, 2, and CD86 um, expression on the cell surface of antigen presenting cells. So we're looking at this process over here. And um, so this is another beautiful cell of a, the image of a T cell. <laughs> and um, what this T cell sees on the antigen presenting cell here are all these um, transmembrane receptors that the antigen presenting cell presents. Um, and we're focusing on MH, the MHCs and CD86. Because if you imagine now that you are a virus and you want to infect this antigen presenting cell, then it would be a good strategy for this virus to simply downregulate these from the cell surface, and the T cell would never know that you're in there, right? And um, there are a few viruses out there that use this immune evasion strategy. Um, for instance, the Kaposi sarcoma associated herpes virus, which expresses two proteins that we now call uh, modulators of immune recognition one and two. And these proteins look somewhat like this, where we have an N-terminal ring CH domain, a TM loop TM a transmembrane domain, which is, you know, resembles these dimers that I've been talking about earlier, and um, a C-terminal tail. And um, what these mere proteins do is they act as E3 ligases and transfer by binding to ubiquitin E2, transfer ubiquitin onto these substrate molecules, which leads to their um, internalization and degradation, and then hence immune evasion. And um, so ever since these, were, these proteins were discovered, the viral proteins in like, the early 2000s or 2000s, um, people have been asking how these three ligases manage to specifically target their substrate proteins and whether this transmembrane domain that's fairly unusual for E3 ligases has anything to do with it. And um, here I want to show you one of the first experiments that were done um, last like 17, 16 years ago. Um, what these guys did is they used a cell line that's surface positive for both CD86 and MHC class 1. And if they transfect the cell line with, um, with MIA1, you can see that MIR1 is able to downregulate MHC class 1 from the cell surface, or at least the ones that got the construct. Um, on the other hand, if we look at the other viral protein, MIR2, we find that this one can downregulate MHC class 1 from the cell surface as well, but it can also downregulate CD86 from the double positive to the double negative population. So the first thing they showed us with this experiment was that MIR1 and MIR2 actually have substrate specificity. They don't just target any substrate, they're specific for them. Um, and, you know, deep, like, and that is even though, even though these two proteins are really, really similar in architecture. But then they did a fairly neat experiment using this similar architecture, because what you can do now with these proteins is do like domain swaps experiment. So if they wanted to know whether the E3 ligase, uh, the, the ring CH domain, has anything to do with sub substrate specificity, they could just take the, um, the ring domain of MIR1, put it onto MIR2, and then see which, which substrate it downregulates. And we can see that this chimeric protein here very much behaves like MIR2. So substrate specificity must lie somewhere in here. Then they did the same experiment with the, with the C-terminal tail, where they also saw that now this, this chimeric protein very much behaves like MIR1, the orange one, because it can only downregulate MHC class 1 from the cell surface. And um, if they then make this last camera, they can show again that it's really this blue bit here in the middle that um, regulates substrate specificity. So something, the TM loop TM um, domains of, this, of these proteins. So and this then um, led in like the early 2000s, very early to this hypothesis that substrate recognition has something to do with maybe, maybe not, um, direct um, transmembrane, transmembrane domain interactions. So this was the, the early hypothesis. And it gets a little bit more complex, but also more interesting, because as it turns out, a few years later, um, us humans and other mammals do express a very similar set of proteins that we now call the March membrane-associated ring CH, E3 ligases. And we express six of these proteins that have a very similar architecture to these viral ones. Because these six here also have this ring domain, TM, loop TM, and the C-terminal tail. And as it turns out, some of these human March proteins 
also downregulate the MHCs, CD86. And they have a whole lot of other um, substrates that are important for our, our normal physiology. And um, you know, because we had this TM loop TM binding to the substrate hypothesis very early on, um, but if you simply look at these transmembrane domains or any other domains, in fact, for, this, for these March E3 ligases, you can't really figure out why certain March proteins target this substrate and other ones target, this, target these substrates. So when I started my PhD, we had the idea to maybe, maybe structure information about these TM domains, potentially even in complex with the, with the substrate DM could tell us something. And um, when I purified these, and I already gave away that it didn't turn out so well, but simply because um, when we take these proteins out of the membrane on their own, they're really not very stable. And this is just to show you, this is this FRAP recovery assay where we can measure stability. Um, so the higher the recovery, the more stable and happy the protein is in our um, membrane-like system. Um, so glycophorin A and DEP12 crystallized, and they're fairly happy. This will go on and recover quite well. But these, especially these human March proteins, just behave really, really terribly and are not happy at all. So if we want to continue on working this, we need to make sure that we learn from the other bits of crystallography that worked, where we simply try and stabilize these transmembrane domains so that we can actually work with them. So we are still learning here. And um, you may remember Cyrus's PhD completion seminar, we tried, or he tried NMR as well, as opposed to crystallography, and simply saw that if, if he takes the March 9 TM loop TM hairpin, then it doesn't really form a stable hairpin at all. So these proteins in isolation seem not to be very happy. And then we went, we moved on from this and thought, okay, we need other better functional assays to investigate what these transmembrane domains and these March proteins actually do. And this is what I want to tell you about in the next 20 minutes. Um, and um, to answer these questions, I wanted to look at a very specific um, system. And these three proteins are the only proteins you have to remember for the rest of this talk. Um, I wanted to look at um, March 1, MIR2, and CD86 mainly, because there's this observation that March 1 downregulates CD86 from the cell surface and MHC class 2, and the viral MIR protein targets CD86 as well, but MHC class 1. So they have similar substrates, one identical, but then also their own unique ones. And I thought well, an interesting question to ask is to now take this viral protein and this human protein and see whether they use the same substrate recognition mechanism to target this protein CD86. So I wanted to know whether they bind the same thing here or whether they actually differ, because so far we don't know that. And um, to do that, um, we established our functional assay here, very similar to what I've shown you before, that we can read using flow cytometry. Um, what I'm using are HeLa cells that are negative for CD86, so I can give them CD86 and have high control over what kind of CD86 I'm going to put in there. Um, this will make, make the heads a green GFP size green reporter gene, so now this is, is transfected, uh, transduced, and we have stable constitutive expression of CD86 on the cell surface. And then there's this second lentiviral vector that we can transduce these cells with that um, have March and MIR um, under docs and usable promoter system in there. So we put this expression card set in there. March and MIR will not be expressed so far. So CD86 can remain on the cell surface until we put doxocycline on for a few days and then we'll observe that CD86 can be downregulated. And if I can show you the facts plots for that, um, so we'll just look at our live cell populations, pre-get them on GFP, and this is a plot now showing um, CD, uh, CD86 surface stain. And you'll see, you see that we have two populations here. One of them has the expression cassette for March in this case in it. This is this population here that's m cherry positive. The other population here did never get the retroviral, like the, uh, the lentiviral vector for March 1. So what happens now if we put doxocycling on there is that this March 1 positive cell, this March 1 positive cell population can now downregulate CD86 from the cell surface, while this one doesn't. So we have a nice internal control in all our facts plots, and if we look at the fluorescence intensities that we can compare between this population and this population, we can come up with a way of quantifying 
um, March or Mir like as activity. And then I can show the, represent the somewhat like this, where this is a very reproducible assay. These are collected within the last two years, I think, so highly reproducible. And I can see that March 1 is about 90% active, which means that 90% of the initial CD86 surface levels are reduced, and 10% are left. Um, if we then look at this in the docs off sample, we can also put this on this graph where we find that, where we just look at the difference between these two populations in the absence of March, and then we have literally no March activity because there's none there. Okay, so I use this assay to address the question whether March 1 and MIR 2 use the same downregulation mechanism to target CD86. And um, one experiment I thought would be really interesting to do is um, if they indeed target the transmembrane domain of CD86 with special motifs that the transmembrane domain has, then if we replace this transmembrane domain by a polyleucine helix, which makes a perfect transmembrane domain, but has literally no features in it other than leucines, which is very generic for a, for a membrane protein when it doesn't do anything. Um, so this was the question we asked. So I have here, I'm showing you fact spots for, um, for MIR2, where wild type is perfectly downregulated, wild type CD86, same for March 1. And then if we replace this wild type CD86 with a polyleucine CD86, we can see that MIR1 is perfectly able, capable in downregulating this, but March 1, not so much. So there's a drastic defect for March 1 in its ability to downregulate a polyleucine CD86 from the cell surface. So first of all, we can see then that the CD86 transmembrane region is sensitive to March 1, but not MIR2. So these two proteins um, should use a different um, CD86 downregulation mechanism. So they're not the same. They, target, they don't target the same area in CD86. And it's lucky that March 1 targets something in the CD86 transmembrane domain that we require for this process. And um, you know, then I went ahead and wanted to follow up on what these CD86 motifs are that sit in the transmembrane domain that is required for this process. And um, you know, if you want to ask this question, you can you can do several things to 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 look into this. Um, what you could do is you could clone a whole bunch of single point mutations into the CD86 transmembrane domain, and then ask whether this point mutation um, does anything. Um, uh, uh, reduces much mediated downregulation. Or like you do an alanine or a polyleucine or a leucine scan and, and substitute this all individually. But um, a few years ago in a journal club in preparation for a Wednesday seminar, we talked about deep mutational scanning. And the nice thing about deep mutational scanning is that rather than cloning a whole bunch of single amino acid substitution, we can clone them all at once, put them all at once um, in our HeLa cells, where, you know, like where each HeLa cell would express one specific CD86 variant on the cell surface, then we can challenge these HeLa cells with March 1, and the wild type scenario would be perfect downregulation of CD86, but we're interested now in which mutations in our CD86 transmembrane domain library are no longer susceptible to March 1 downregulation. And then we can just do this assay once and use next generation sequencing to uh, figure out what accumulated in here compared to here or compared to our starting population. And um, so what I did then, I had to, do, I had to um, basically clone and generate my own CD86 library. So what we did as described in this paper is there's a, you can um, order primers to do overlap PCRs that have, let's say this is a transmembrane region that you wanted to randomize. You can just tell the company when they synthesize the primer, rather than using 100% stock of A to synthesize that primer, use, 90, use 97% and, and dope in 1% of the, the wrong nucleotides. And then simply by chance, when they synthesize this primer, you'll incorporate point mutations into this a primer and then eventually in the CD86 transmembrane domain. So this is what we did, and just simply for practical reasons, because we didn't want to use a massive primer that spans the entire transmembrane domain, we split um, this transmembrane domain in half and cloned two half libraries. And um, so we then gave this um, to Stephen Wilcox for, for next generation sequencing and used Alan Rubin's 
um, enriched software to look at the, the library that we have um, that I cloned into my plasmid, the library that I established um, for, the, for the top bit. And we can see here, um, there's the, the wild type sequence right here. And we can find that on average, we mutated all of the amino acid residues in this top half of the library to about six to eight others. And this is yeah, simply because we're only looking for single point mutations. And if you look at how codons work, if you only change one nucleotide at a time, then you can only access eight, nine other, other amino acids. So this is actually what we would expect. And we have a wealth of information in this um, top half of the CD86 transmembrane library that we can now use in our assay. Um, what didn't work, and we're still not quite sure why, um, is cloning the second half of the library because we got beautiful PCR products, but there, there, well, that was pretty much all wild type. And we have a solution for that that I'll come to in a few minutes. But I want to tell you what we saw when we just went with this top half of the library and see if the deep mutational scanning works for our system. And I'm going to show you what we saw here. So we're making, so I made retrovirus with this plasmid library that I just sequenced, put into HeLa cells, and now each HeLa cell will express one specific variant on the surface, challenged this with, with, um, with March 1, and then went downstairs to the, to the sorter and sorted this population over here from this population over here. Because this population here would now have all these variants that are no longer receptive to March 1 downregulation. So I took these, put them in culture again, grew them for a few days, and then um, did a second DOCS treatment and a, and a second sort. And you see here that these accumulate, like that we accumulated for cells that express CD86 on the cell surface that March 1 can't downregulate anymore. So what we want to know then is, okay, what are these variants? This is what we essentially want to know. So we used next generation sequencing to sequence this population and look at which variants enriched in this population compared to the starting population right here. And when we did that, then um, Alan Rubin's Enrich software gives us lots of nice, beautiful graphs when we give it um, our sequencing data. And one of a, a very useful graph for us is this one, where we see the wild type sequence here. And what we're interested in now is looking at all of these enriched mutants that enriched in our um, population that cannot be downregulated by March 1. And then you see, for instance, this hotspot here where proline was mutated into four other residues that are no longer receptive to March and a few others here in red. And, um, you know, if you just look at this graph, you think, okay, well, this looks fairly random, right? Um, but it's pretty cool when you put this all on the helix, then you see that these... Um, variants actually, or these mutations, have helical periodicity, which means they all fall on one side of the CD86 helix. And at this point, we thought, oh, okay, cool, this assay worked, because it simply makes biological or biochemical sense, because they're not randomly distributed, they all fall on one side of the helix. And it probably, so this, this means that this side of the helix phase of the CD86 transmembrane domain must be the one that makes it susceptible to March 1 downregulation. And um, so we only well, we, we got the results for that back a few weeks ago, and I, or a few months ago, and then I cloned um, these single mutations. For instance, if we look at a proline to alanine substitution right here, and we do the assay with um, this single point mutant, we can already see that this susceptibility compared to wild type CD86. Um, if we put March 1 in, is reduced. And um, I have more cells on docs as we speak to get some statistics on that. And um, I looked at a few others as well. And for most of them, I can see a very slight reduction in susceptibility in these preliminary assays, um, which tells me that this assay, deep mutational scanning, is very sensitive in picking up um, um, mutants that, are, that have reduced susceptibility towards March 1 downregulation. And what we need to do now is put all of these together, because they're all single mutants, and test this entire phase. But what we also want to do is repeat this assay using <laughs> the entire CD86 transmembrane domain. And we also want to get a bit of a better um, coverage of all our mutants, so that we're actually looking at uh, replacing this uh, proline over here and all the other 20 amino acids. And we want to 
actually simply do this by rather than using these dope primers that we use for cloning the C86 library, we want to use individual primers where each amino acid position is completely randomized. It's a bit more work in cloning, but um, you can already see by Sanger sequencing when I, close, uh, when I clone a construct like this, we have one position here, this codon here, that's completely randomized and that will very likely give me all 20 amino acids. And um, then we'll repeat this assay again with, uh, with a full CD86 transmembrane library. Okay, so what I've shown you so far about the March MIR system is that MIR2 and March1 both downregulate CD86, but, that the, but the CD86 transmembrane domain is required for downregulation by March1, but not by MIR2. And this is pretty much um, consistent with the literature because Satoshi's group in China um, this basically identified a crucial motif in the loop region for MIR2 and the CD86 juxta membrane region right here. So this is all pretty much consistent. And um, what I haven't told you about yet, though, is what's happening here at the March transmembrane domain and the MIR2 transmembrane domain. And I don't want to go into like, great detail what we did here, but I want to tell you something about the MIR2 transmembrane domain. Because simply, if you look at this model here, you'd say, well, CD86 doesn't need the transmembrane domain to be targeted by MIR2, why would the MIR2 transmembrane domain be important in downregulating CD86? It's a bit counterintuitive, and I want to show you that we have some evidence to support that these domains is, um, is important in spite of that. Um, so if you look at the, the MIR2 transmembrane domain like here, um, with, the, with transmembrane helix 1 shown here, transmembrane 2 here, then you can see that the MIR2 transmembrane domain actually has one of these glycophorin A motifs, which means that potentially it can use this glycophorin A motif to form very tight interactions with other helices. And we thought, oh, that's interesting, because in many cases these, these glycophorin A motifs just do that. And it falls here on this side of the helix. See, this is all really, really small. And now if we introduce bulk into this, these small amino acid residues, which we can do by um, changing glycine residues into isoleucine residues. And if we really have a tight interface, then the polyleucine would disrupt this tight, in, this tight interface. And if we do this for this glycine here, we can measure by facts, there's maybe a slight reduction, not significant. And if we mutate this entire glycophorin A motif, as shown here, we see a small reduction. And if we introduce more isoleucine in this small um, helix phase, then we'll get even a stronger reduction of MIR2 activity. Um, <clears throat> another very interesting um, feature of the MIR2 transmembrane domain um, we observed right here, where the MIR2 transmembrane domain has eight, a total of eight aromatic residues, which is highly unusual for a transmembrane domain to have. So we thought, okay, these must do something. If you put this on the helix, it also looks really, really cool because we have these like rings, like it almost forms half a ring around the transmembrane domain, these clusters somewhere right here. And what happens if we changed all of these to valines at the same time is that we could completely kill the activity of the, March, of the MIR2 protein. So there's basically no detectable activity left um, for a protein that has all these aromatic residues changed into valines. Um, we have to follow up on one thing here because, I mean, what can always happen is you make a mutant, this mutant's not stable, it doesn't express anymore, so we wanted to follow this up, and we can see, and it took me a while to find the right text to actually detect them, the wild-type protein has a very strong signal, expression signal, in this first Western plot that, I, that I've done here. Um, the mutant has definitely reduced um, protein levels in it, and we're currently following up in um, looking at the, at the concentration dependence in CD86 downregulation using fax or microscopy to follow up on this. But I'm also gonna repeat this Western blot a few more times to see if this is actually a thing. Um, a second, a second um, method that we used, because um, sometimes if you change the transmembrane domains, you may mess up trafficking throughout the cell. So I had a look and used this flag, flag, double flag tag on my MIR2 protein and had a first look where it, is, where it actually is in the cell. We can see some accumulates around the nucleus, but then locates in small vesicles throughout the cell. And we can see that for the, um, for the 
aromatic mutant, we can see very similar behavior. Um, the intensity is matched, so the protein levels are in fact reduced, but we can see that it still locates um, into these vesicles. So if we compare the two, we know that there's at least no gross trafficking defect. And um, so it's, I think it's worth for us following up what um, the concentration levels do here. And um, to sum this up, um, so I've shown you that the transmembrane domain of CD86 is not important in being targeted by MIR2, but we've been finding all these motifs, the glycophorin A motif, this aromatic motif, and then a third one that I didn't talk about, um, which can only mean that the transmembrane domains of this MIR2 protein must confer some sort of functionality to the protein that is different from direct substrate recognition, which is what the field exclusively discusses. And um, so what these transmembrane domains could, could um, regulate is, well, it could be just the folding or stability of the protein itself. Maybe it needs to pack in a certain way to position the loop perfectly to bind to this residue right here. But also, and I think this would be really interesting to follow up, is whether these MIR2 proteins need to actually form higher order oligomers. And then only if you have these oligomers, um, we're able to downregulate this from the cell surface. Or maybe even there are other proteins that are in this complex that are required for the ubiquitination to happen that we simply don't know about yet. But there's probably more going on than a simple one-on-one -on -one ubiquitination downregulation um, reaction here. And um, yeah, we've done similar things on March 1, but I'm not going to talk about this today. And um, want to conclude and come to an end. So today I've told you about seemingly different biological systems that all have in common that they are regulated, at least to some degree, by um, their alpha helical transmembrane domains right here. And I've shown you using um, glycophorin A as an example that we are able to crystallize these transmembrane interactions or these transmembrane helices to look at um, these interactions in great detail. And we're using this for, for um, other interesting receptor systems at the moment. And I've also shown you that we, could, that we can use deep mutational scanning on transmembrane domains to figure out the um, sequence requirements of these transmembrane domains for proper function. And I think now we have two really nice tools here to understand a few other receptor systems, like, for instance, this thrombopoietin receptor that I told you about. Because, you know, crystallography is pretty good at looking at protein small molecule interactions. So we're trying to crystallize the TPO receptor in the presence of this activating drug called thrombopack. But we can also use deep mutational scanning on these transmembrane domain to figure out where interaction surfaces between these two helices lie. And with that, I want to finish. And first of all, thank my supervisors for being really great supervisors and mentors and friends and for giving me a home when I was in the street twice <laughs> when I was living here. <laughs> and <laughs> so thanks for that. And also thanks to other present and past members of our lab and the entire structural biology division. Um, when I moved here, I didn't know anyone, and you've all been great friends and really good to me. Um, thanks to Jackie, Peter, and Nick for advising me as my committee throughout my PhD. Thanks to Andrew and Giuseppe for, the, for giving me a moldy and the occasional ESI um, run. Thanks to Stephen and Alan for, the, for next gen sequencing and discussions about deep mutational scanning. Um, to Kelly and Mark for helping me set up the, the FRAP assay. And for Marie Fowle, who did the first immunostains with me um, two weeks ago. Um, thanks to C3, Janet, Shane, and Bevan for setting up lots of crystal trials for me and other collaborators and work in LCP. And to Cyril that I just met, that we just met a couple of months ago for giving me nice peptides that crystallize. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and then also thanks to um, all my friends, to my husband, who will hopefully soon also be my husband in Australia if the voting <laughs> goes well. And um, to other present and past members of the Grief Street House, the Wednesday Dumplings Group and other family and friends. Thanks. I'll just start by clarifying that um, that Rap never spent a single night no. in the street. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> to, to my knowledge. Almost. Well, he's not an entire night. Okay. And he's left himself plenty of time for grilling yes. questions. 
Uh, Ed in the back. Um, uh, the hydrofluoridated motif is yes. compared to protein. Yeah. So that's only on one helix. Yes. So does that only form a binding site with other helices from a separate um, molecule? And then I guess an additional question. Was it surprising that the triple mutants in that motif only partially reduced the activity? Um, so we don't know what it binds to yet. So, I mean, it can always bind to like a helix on the same molecule. It does that in bigger transmembrane proteins sometimes. But what we would look for is if the glycophorin A motif is indeed important, whether we can find complementary regions on other substrate proteins where we could, you know, it doesn't have to be within the mere transmembrane domains but maybe it recognizes other substrates specifically via this glycophorin A motif. Or it could just simply bind to another protein that we don't know yet that's required in the complex. But if we know that this motif is important, it gives us a bit of a hint of where to look at. And I guess this, this is the idea about figuring out which motifs are actually important for their function. Yep. Actually, FYQ, which seems even more unusual to me in the centre of the membrane. What yeah. known about that? You might have said it on this. Yeah, so I didn't speak about the Q motif, because there's also the MIR2 transmembrane that has, a, has basically another, I mean, I can show you this, Some, has basically another glutamate, glutamine in there, which is also, like, which sits right here, which is also highly unusual because this simply needs a hydrogen bonding partner somewhere in the membrane. And we also mutated this, and we can also see a, re a reduced activity to about 50% or even lower if we take this phase out. So there's actually two in there. Um, we're not sure whether um, we should look at them in, like, separately or whether they're actually doing the same thing. But um, yeah, this motif is also, also seems to be important. And interestingly, that's why I like this, is the glutamine, or the, uh, yeah, the glutamine phase sits somewhere here, which is small amino acids and glutamine. And then the aromatic sits outside, which makes me believe, you know, maybe this one's important in folding a hairpin. The other one's targets other on binds to other proteins via aromatic interactions. Um, we don't know what that is yet, but yeah, they seem to both do something. There's lots of interesting motifs in there. <laughs> uh, um, if you're frac data, you're mapped to, I think, your omega 1 and you are DAP 12 results are really, really similar to each other. Yes. Do you think that you're merging crystallized perhaps because of precipitation rather than perhaps lack of movement? Um, so they're actually not, so they start really close. Yeah. DAP 12 will, however, slowly recover to almost 100%. And if you look at the images, there's really no precipitation in there. And MIR2, which actually looked really good if you only measure for five minutes, but it all looks pretty precipitated in there. And that basically skews your results a little bit, because when you, you know, <laughs> you, yeah, you can't really find a representative region if everything is precipitated. Um, so looking at, we all, always need to look at those curves together with the actual images that I haven't shown you, but they look pretty terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Andreas? So I think the, the subcellular localization you showed with the um, stating as there was March 2, is that correct? Um, MIA 2, oh, yeah, the, the viral protein, yeah. So when I look at that, it makes me wonder, does the um, degradation of CD86 and yep. MHC class 1, does that really happen on the plasma membrane or could it happen on the ER? Because I could see quite a bit of yes. near 2 staining on the ER. So do you know where it actually happens? Yes. So we're not certain for all of the March and MIR proteins where it actually happens. And it's actually a big <coughs> point of discussion. Um, there's some data that suggests that most March proteins that target the MHCs are at the cell surface at some point. But the um, actual ubiquitination reaction may happen in sorting endosomes. Um, but we're, we're not 100% sure where they are and where the ubiquitination reaction occurs or where the interaction occurs. We don't know. 
Um, we know that the MIRs mainly reside in the ER and the Golgi. So MIRs probably, probably, uh, the MIR probably, proteins probably work in the Golgi. Yeah. So if you did surface labeling of the, for example, class one MHC with yeah. giving Fitzy from the outside, would that yeah. give you a clue? Yeah. Where the degradation occurs in? Yeah, that would give us a clue. And um, so I've only started doing that because I needed, there's no antibody for the MIRS and I had to find the right tags. But now that we know that we can actually get decent images, um, I'm probably <coughs> going to do some surface stands and um, see what happens to the C86 substrates and also coast them with other um, intracellular markers to see where it is and when it goes there. Um, that's something to follow up to because it would be interesting if that's, in, if that's different between wild type and mutants, right? They could still distribute the same, but how they get there could be different. Um, yeah, but that's an interesting question to follow up to, yeah. Um, you found proline in the transmembrane domain of CD86 was important? Yes. Um, from memory, proline is unusual in transmembrane domains and yes. it produces a kink? Yes. Do you think that might be part of the... Yes, that could be, that, I mean, that proline could be structurally important to, into, to introduce that kink and help it do what it does. I mean, there's so far only, there's a structure of FAS out there that uses prolines to literally introduce that kink and form a trimer. So sometimes these prolines are, um, are important to form a specific structure. So that, that could be something. So if, if that's the case, then yeah. in mutation pretty much would bring it back into the a straight line? Yeah, probably. At least the, the hydrophobic ones. But that's why it would be so interesting to get... I mean, it was pretty good to have all the positions um, substituted um, by six to eight amino acids in our library screen. But this is also why we like to see a full library, because then we could see at this position proline. So far we see that it basically loses activity when we substitute it into polar amino acids and alanines, but the non-polar amino acids didn't do anything. So if we change this into a leucine, I believe it did not accumulate in that population, and leucine didn't do anything, but a hydroxide group at that place would do. This is why that screen would be so nice to get a full library. And then you can actually say, ah, oh, this just can't be hydrophobic, but it can be, you know, hydrophilic. So this, this is why this, these screens are so nice. But yeah, good point. Final question, Angus? This um, very rich transmembrane helix, is that unique to MIR2 or is it on marches? And have you seen it in any Which, which transmembrane helix? The, the very rich. Ah, uh, yeah. Is that the, Yes, so the um, other viral protein, MIR1, has the exact same aromatics at the exact same place. So this helix and the other viral protein differs in all the others, I think, but the aromatic network's still there. Um, the March proteins don't have it. They have aromatic residues on the flanking regions, which is not too unusual. In any other transmembrane proteins before? Or have you ever looked at this motif in other transmembrane? Mm, no. <laughs> um, I mean, I mean, there are, so uh, for it, no, that's actually not true. So the 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 v, the vesicular the VEGF receptor, one of the receptor tyrosine kinases, they use not a not a aromatic residues, but they have a little cluster that sits just in the center here. So I mean, I don't know of another example with eight, but I know of an example that has three. And they, that's actually one of the ones that we have a structure of, where we can see that they use aromatic stacking for dimerization. But eight, haven't seen that before. But I wasn't actively looking. <laughs> okay, we are one minute after four, so let's thank uh, Raph for a great talk.